Um, I was asked to give a bit of an introduction about myself. Um, uh, originally, I'm from a dairy farm in eastern Ontario. Um, I grew up in eastern Ontario. I went to uh, Carleton University with a bachelor's degree in physical geography and biology. Then went on to uh, southern Ontario, did a, a, a PhD and a master's degree uh, at the University of Guelph there um, in soil fertility and crop production. Um, in two, early 2002, or uh, 2003 rather, I moved to Alberta. Um, to work with uh, the University of Alberta uh, in a postdoc type position. Uh, that kind of migrated into uh, a slightly different role. At the time, I was sort of cross-appointed between the uh, University of Alberta and uh, the provincial government in, in Alberta. Um, <clears throat> in about 2004, an opportunity came over to look at uh, and take over sort of the management and coordination of Alberta's soil quality benchmark sites. So looking at soil quality across the province and how is it in terms of productivity um, and general the, the attributes associated with quality. I did that for quite a number of years uh, and then in around uh, 2008, 2007-2008, a provincial initiative started uh, called the Land Use Framework. Um, just by show of hands, how many people are familiar or have heard of at least the Land Use Framework? Okay, good. That's probably more than most audiences I talk to, so I don't have to start at ground one at here. Um, so that was initiated in 2007-2008 with uh, consultations across Alberta. Um, at the time, I was working with the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, which is now known as uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Food. Uh, was directly involved in representing agricultural interests in the land use framework in the regional planning process and in some of the uh, sub-strategies that were contained within the plan. I did that uh, for quite a number of years, actually up until July of last year, uh, at which point an opportunity came over to move into the Land Use Secretariat as the Director of Regional Planning. Um, so it's my responsibility eventually here to get all seven of these regional plans developed across the province. So with that as a bit of a backdrop, um, in terms of the presentation today, uh, I'm going to be touching a little bit on some of the work that we do at the, regional, at the regional planning scale relative to land use. I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the work that I did with agriculture and forestry in terms of responding to maintaining agricultural land, be it for local production or, or um, export-based large production elsewhere in the province. Okay, um, <clears throat> so land use framework. In, a, a subject in an area in need of policy relative to agricultural land or land in general. Um, as I mentioned, this, this initiative got its foothold in 2006-2007 with a number of consultations across the province that looked at um, managing or better managing the growth, uh, economic growth and development in the province. As was mentioned in the introduction, we are an oil-based province which is subject to, to uh, boom and bust cycle, uh, cycles. Um, 2008, you'll remember, was a significant boom. There were a lot of people, including myself leading up to that, moving from other parts of Canada into Alberta to support the oil and gas sector. We had a tremendous amount of growth pressure, tremendous amount of demand for recreation along our eastern slopes and into the Rocky Mountain areas. And at the time, government was looking at a better way of not stopping growth, but better managing it. Um, so this is where the, the land use framework that was released in December of 2008 kind of came about. Uh, it was designed to address Alberta's growth pressures and to be sustainable over a long time frame. Um, the framework I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on because that's not what today's talk is, but it basically it is uh, designed to establish a provincial vision uh, and set a series of desired outcomes that look at balancing not only the economic aspects of growth, but also the environmental and social components associated with growth in this province. Um, there are a number of different strategies within the plan. There are seven major things that the province is committed to doing, and then there were a number of other areas that were identified as policy gaps. One of those areas was around food, uh, land for agriculture. Um, actually, during consultation in 2007-2006, Albertans it, uh, basically indicated to the government that there, the general public was concerned about food security in this province and they also felt that the government of Alberta was not doing enough to stop urban and residential sprawl. Um, in response to that, my ministry at the time, Agriculture and Rural Development, along with uh, colleagues from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, set about looking at this, this subject. 
is it really an issue? Where is this issue? And we spent quite a number of years, um, and we'll kind of get to that in a moment within the slide decks, but quite a number of years looking at the policy and determining whether it actually is an issue. What do people mean by food security? What we did find overwhelming, overwhelmingly, and this is where it often makes me unpopular in, in uh, audiences such as this one, is that it, it's not as big an issue as most people make it out to be for the province of Alberta. But more importantly, there was a lot of confusion around what local food, food security, food sovereignty, shopping local, that connection that uh, people have to the restaurants and the food that they eat. There was a lot of confusion around that and in terms of potentially perhaps how some of that information was gathered, but really what it was doing is kind of confusing some of the issues. So we spent quite a number of years looking at this. Uh, I mean, we are an export-based province in terms of agriculture. I mean, that is where the provincial government lies from an agriculture aspect. In 2014, uh, we had sort of record sales of about $9.7 billion in export. Uh, sort of between 46% of that associated with primary production, that is field crop production, and then 31% associated with agri-food and agri-products um, uh, agri coming out of that. So um, the issue around, or the, the, the mantra that we're unfortunately close to starvation, which was something we heard a lot about, really when it's, we are so heavily export focused is really a difficult sell. But it is an issue and we, re we did realize that. Um, a number of things that we did when we were going through this, and I, I could spend an hour talking about this, but what we really found was perceptions around the loss of agricultural land really depended who you were, where you live, and where your state and life is. Um, typically what we saw was rural landowners, those that are living, say, in the eastern parts of the province or farm large areas of land, they're really more interested in fragmentation. They're, the loss of land is not so much a significant component to them, but rather how it is broken up either by transmission corridors or country residential development, those types of things. That's really where their concerns are because it is around efficiencies of scale, being able to farm around all of these things that makes it difficult. Urban landowners, on the other hand, don't understand the fragmentation issue. They see directly as a conversion issue, the loss of agricultural land, particularly pronounced around urban centers, Quite often, having lived in the Edmonton area, I'd respond to people who called into the ministry saying, they're building on the land that my family has owned for hundreds of years that I sold to Melcor last year. Yeah. And you're going, well, yeah. unfortunately, you sold it to Melcor. Melcor is not a farming company, they're a development company. So it makes it really challenging. Uh, in terms of where you are in state of life, older producers really don't want government intervening in this at all. In the agricultural world, land is often viewed as an opportunity for land banks or, or uh, retirement savings, the ability to sell a parcel out, and having the freedom of doing that. They don't want government intervention coming in and saying, you can't. The flip side of that is younger producers find it particularly difficult to enter into agriculture, particularly if you live around urban centers, where you need a secondary off-farm income. So you're working in that area of wanting to farm, perhaps small, acreages close to the city so that you can farm evenings and weekends and still have a day job that you can commute to during the day. So they're looking for government intervention into the subject. And then the final two that I sort of put up there, uh, if you live along the corridor, that being essentially Edmonton to Calgary, or if you extend it a little further, Grand Prairie to Lethbridge, you really have an interest in this because you do see agricultural land being swallowed. It does align to our most productive agricultural lands in the province. That is where development occurs. It's along the river valleys, all of those types of areas. They, want to, they often express that they want to see policy to protect agricultural land. If I go east towards Saskatchewan, they don't see this as an issue at all. There's tons of agricultural land you can go for hours without seeing development. So really what I want to impress upon this is that provincial policy in the area of protecting agricultural is extremely difficult because it doesn't work provincially. This is a local issue that I encourage municipalities to deal with at the municipal level. And this is where the province has sort of come forward saying, we're not in the game yet to look at provincial level policy, but we want to work with municipalities because they understand their land base, they understand the constituents that vote for their councils, uh, and they tend to be more flexible and easy to adapt, much more so than the pro uh, provincial government. 
So a bit of an outline for the presentation. Um, I'm going to spin the wheel basically here and we're going to look at four different areas that all sort of contribute to the protection of agricultural land for what is local food or the production local. This might be small acreages, a few acres on horticultural production, or it might be a thousand acre grain farm out in the outskirts of, uh, of the city here. Um, the four areas that I'm going to look at basically are agricultural land policy in Alberta, what it currently is either through the provincial land use policies or regional plans. I want to look at agricultural land monitoring and reporting because that was something that clearly came out of the land use framework directed towards Ag uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Food at the time. We have no solid data since 1995 that indicates that it is a problem. We have a lot of anecdotal data but not solid data on which to build policy from. Okay, um, legislatively enabled tools, efficient use of lands. So uh, agricultural land policy in Alberta, basically. Since 1996, fragmentation and conversion of agricultural lands was managed through the provincial land use policies and local statutory bylaws. The problem is the government of Alberta at the provincial level doesn't monitor them, it doesn't follow them. Uh, we have no idea how effective these are locally, either at the municipal level or otherwise. But we do know they tend to be very uh, um, variable among the various municipalities. Some are better than others. The current policy direction up until at least April of 2011, depending on whether regional plans are in a neighborhood near you, is the continuation of these provincial land use policies, which is really about identify your primary ag lands, direct development away from it, minimize fragmentation and minimize uh, conflict among non-agricultural users. Continue to do that, but then the ministry was charged with monitoring, evaluation and reporting of agricultural land to determine how big the issue is. So, what does that create? In Alberta, we have kind of a, uh, a patchwork grid at the moment. In areas with regional plans, the provincial land use policies have been swept into regional plans. Uh, so it's the continuation of the existing ones. Municipalities are now expected to limit fragmentation and conversion. When the province comes out and expects something under the land use framework, we did provide tools to do so, and I'll touch on these very shortly. Uh, regional plans also recognize the importance of small agricultural holdings in terms of the overall agricultural system in the province. It doesn't necessarily have to be big agriculture all the time. Small holdings do play an important role. Uh, and then uh, the AF's uh, Ag and Forestry's legal requirement to monitor and report on change of the agricultural land base. If you're not in an area with a regional plan, uh, the expectation basically is that you follow the 1996 provincial land use policies, which <laughs> Uh, uh, the province is going to monitor regardless the effectiveness of that. So monitoring and reporting. Um, ag and forestry did have to develop a, um, a process to do this. Uh, we spent quite a number of years actually looking at this. This was a project that I was directly involved in. We actually use uh, land uh, title base size, like the, the land's title base, looking at the size of holdings in there as a proxy for agricultural land conversion. Um, we work with four classes. We look at urban lands, we look at agricultural land, we look at rural residential, and then we look at everything else. Uh, basically, if you're between 10 and 240 acres, you're agricultural. If you're less than 10, you tend to be uh, a rural residential. When we do this, uh, we find it's almost identical to what census is predicting. So when we look at title parcel size for all agricultural lands in the province, we get roughly that 21.1 million hectares of land, which is where its census says Alberta should be. Um, very quickly to look at where we were, this is a graph of agricultural land uh, losses in red, gains in green, because we do gain agricultural land. And then the net change is the blue line. From 1976 to 1995, was the first series of data. Uh, we did hire a consultant to look at what happens between 95 and 2009. Uh, and then most recently, we've been looking at 2011 to 2015. Provincially, we've actually gained agricultural land. 10,000 hectares of new agricultural land occurs in this province. It is dominantly in northern Alberta of a, um, a slightly lower quality than what is being lost along the agricultural corridor. And much of it is attributed to a public land sales that occurred in Mackenzie County up near high level and uh, Fort Vermilion. Capital region does experience a loss, 3,836, and that's the five rural municipalities that surround Edmonton. 
Uh, and then along the corridor, so essentially from that point all the way down to Calgary, it's a loss of 16,000 hectares. So we know it's an issue, and no one's arguing the fact that it's an issue. Um, very quickly, this is what it looks like. Edmonton's in the center. If you're kind of yellow, it's a net, like a zero change. Uh, losses are red or the orangey color. So in through here, we're seeing losses. Not much change in 2012, 2013. Losses, we had a gain in Beaver County in 2013, 2014. And then um, sort of that leveling of uh, the data over the um, couple of years. Um, <clears throat> second last section basically is the legislative tools. As I said, we expect municipalities to do a better job monitoring their agricultural land. We did set into play through the Alberta Land Stewardship Act a number of uh, legislative tools for doing that. So this is specific to uh, four particular tools uh, that are contained within part three of the act. One is around conservation easements, which are not a new concept. They've been around in Alberta since the 1980s. What was extended with the 2009 Alberta Land Stewardship Act was agricultural lands or lands for agricultural purposes are now included as something that can be put under an agricultural easement in the province. The challenge is, is we don't see many of these yet still, and it has to do a little bit with the qualified organization that has to hold them. Uh, conservation directives is something that we don't explore. It's a provincial tool. Uh, conservation offsets is something that the province is very active in, particularly more in uh, industrial settings in terms of offsetting uh, oil and gas industries if avoidance and mitigation can't be uh, achieved. Transfer of development credits is one of the tools that we're actually seeing some interest in. Um, I'm actually working with a municipality in southern Alberta on a, a TDC program uh, for the Glenbow Ranch area, which is the area between Calgary and um, Cochrane area, just north of Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park. Um, and then the final section to look at in terms of tools, and I'll give you the websites for these at the last slide. Uh, one of the strategies that came out of the land use framework was strategy five, it's efficient use of land. Uh, and this is about promoting efficient use, minimizing the extent of the built environment and trying to contain the amount of development that actually occurs. Do we need to make all of our installations be them uh, industrial or residential? Do we need to spread them out so much or we can tend to focus them more to ensure that there's a land base? Uh, it's based on six principles, reducing the rate of conversion, using the minimum amount of land, emphasizing infill and redevelopment and shared use within uh, existing developments. Utilizing existing infrastructure, if you're a developer, you understand what that is. If you can tap into current water and sewer lines, it's much cheaper than building new. Timely and alternate rec uh, reclamation, uh, and ensuring that information's available. And that's why I'll give you the website here in two seconds, uh, that you can actually have a look at these and determine what they look like. Uh, the tool compendium that was produced looks at 29 voluntary best practices that can be used by landowners or municipalities. Uh, it is considered a living document. We're always going into it, looking at it, determining whether uh, new tools could be added or tools should come out. Uh, it is uh, something that all of the tools within there are legislatively able to be put into the Alberta context. Because quite often we look to the U.S., for examples, and they're under a different constitutional system, which doesn't allow a direct transfer of that knowledge sometimes. So these 29 tools are, as I mentioned, some are being piloted already, the Glenbow area, or Glenbow Ranch area. Um, the 29 tools basically are set up to uh, show whether the tool can be used mandatory or voluntary, whether it's local, regional, or provincial, and the scope of activity. Uh, whether it's an urban tool, a rural-based tool, or something that can be used in both examples, and whether they touch the, the six principles that I spoke to earlier, which tools touch each of those. So there is a table. This is just a snapshot of the first six tools that are in the book. As I said, there are 29 of these listed, and I encourage you to actually have a look to see where they are. So in summary, Fragment, land fragmentation and the loss of agricultural land or the conversion of agricultural land is a really complicated issue. Uh, there are many valid reasons out there to protect agricultural land, but the challenge is, is few are universally applicable across a large part of the province. They tend to be more localized. They tend to be more focused towards the municipalities and the people who live within those areas to know the lands best. The tools are available. We do provide them either legislatively through the Alberta Land Stewardship Act or through efficient use of lands, uh, the compendium. 
Uh, and they're available for both the municipalities and individuals for the voluntary protection. So we're not at a stage of making it mandatory. So with that, thank you. The two websites of importance on this talk are the Land Use Framework itself. You can just Google Land Use Framework Alberta and it comes up. Uh, efficient use of lands is fully described there. You can download the compendium of tools uh, and it tells you how they operate and explains case studies in the Alberta context. And then uh, the agricultural land monitoring, a little more detail in terms of what that data looks like leading from 76 through to, to current, can be found at Agriculture and Forestry's reporting site, which is there. So with that, thank you very much.